All right, good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Ditha Ramachandra from the NR Hour Sports Show. This is episode 818, uh, joined by a special guest, Jimmy Smith, a two-time Super Bowl champ from the Dallas Cowboys. He also played for the Jaguars, and he's a wide receiver. Uh, and I'm joined by two of our co-hosts from the show, Kia Lyons and uh, Global Kimita Vedant. Uh, thanks for joining us to the show, uh, Jimmy. Uh, how are you and your family doing uh, today? Doing great. Thanks for having me on the show. No problem. So uh, I'll let uh, whoever, you got, whoever wants to start off first, I'll let Kia or Vedant to start off first. Go ahead, Vedant. All right. Um, I want to know, first and foremost, uh, I, I'm in Michigan, and I know you're a Detroit guy. Grew up here in, in, in the home state for sure. Talk about your coming up getting to the NFL, getting to where you got to, going through Jackson State, you know, that whole journey. But I, I really want to start at the roots, the beginning. What were you doing as a young kid? What else was there besides football? Good question. Well, uh, I started out playing baseball. My dad had just happened to be the coach for a baseball team. We were so bad, we were called the Bad News Bombers. Not the Bad News Bears, but the Bad News Bombers. We may have won one game. I think it may have been the last game of the season. And then we came back year two, and we just kicked everybody's butt. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, my dad was real proud. Uh, all the neighborhood boys, you know, that needed something to do. Uh, incredible role model my dad was as far as a lot of the guys that uh, – a lot of the fathers that were in the neighborhood that I grew up in, Jackson, Mississippi, I was only born in Detroit because my father was uh, playing with the Cincinnati Bengals at the time. Okay. And my mom wanted to be closer to him. So she decided to move to Detroit uh, to live with her brother during the time that, I, that she was pregnant with me. And that's how I come to be born in the city of Detroit. But I know nothing about Detroit, though. I was I was raised in Jackson, Mississippi. Hmm. Very cool, very cool. So you were a a bad news. What was it? Bad news bombers. Bad well, news bombers. really, it, we, we, silk we were the bombers. Then you we became the bombers. Silk. <laughs> yeah, we were the bombers. And the first year we were horrible, and then the second year we went undefeated. So just a little. Uh, I didn't play football until uh, well, my mom wanted me to be this straight-A student, which I could have, but at that age, I was rebelling against my mom's wishes and wanting me wanting me to be this scholar student. Uh, and the reason I rebelled is because she didn't want me to play football. Right. Uh, she didn't want me to get hurt. She didn't. She had no, no clue. She had love for you. She did. She wanted me to be a scholar, and that was it. And uh, – Obviously, my dad had to go along with her, and that's where the baseball team came about. But uh, I ended up playing football uh, when I was 12 years old, sixth grade, and I went to Holy Family, which is a Catholic school slash church. Hmm. Uh, very close-knit type family type deal there, and I was immediately became a star uh, just – the best one on the on the I mean there were some good players but I was one of the best players on that team and uh at every level it, you know I realized that I was uh head and shoulders better than 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 most most of the kids in football that is did that just how did that feel like energetically to just you know well it motivated me succeed yes it motivated me. My dad played football and I always wanted to be in the NFL and play on Monday night as a little kid. And even though my dad played middle linebacker, I wanted the ball in my hands. You know, I wanted to score touchdowns. I used to look at Billy White, Sue Johnson and Wes Chandler and, uh, you know, all those old schoolers, Stan, you know, the, 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 the uh, San Diego Chargers was my favorite team. I loved them. Kellen Winslow at tight end. And I just liked ball catchers. Uh, and when I was in ninth grade, I went to St. Joseph's Catholic High okay. School. And uh, I was placed at running back. And me and a friend of mine, Vernon Beeman, my best friend, we tagged him at running back. And we had to be the best in the state in the ninth grade at that tandem. Uh, I was promised, well, we were promised, all the black kids were promised 
Well, I shouldn't say all the black kids. That's wrong. You might have to edit that. But we were promised, <laughs> no, we were promised at the end of the season that we will be able to play in the last high school football game. You know, the guys who were really good on the ninth grade team. So I knew I was going to be the one. Vernon knew he was going to be the one. He was my best friend. Yeah. And when that game came about, man, we waited and we waited. I kept looking back in the stands at my mom and dad, and they were just like <laughs> – looking like, okay, when's it going to get in? When's it going to get in? And I never did get into the game. They played uh, a guy named Jay Angelo. I'm sure Jay Angelo would love to say to them. That was weird. Yeah. Yeah. But you played beyond that, so. Well, let me tell you, uh, after I didn't play in that last game at St. Joseph's High School, I was so mad that I wanted to transfer. I didn't want to be at the school anymore. Yeah. Um, and some of that was because I wanted to go to Callaway High School, which was the district that I lived in. And their football team was like ranked like top 20 in the, in the country at that time. So everybody in the city wanted to play for Callaway. I mean, if you play for Callaway, it was just like playing for UM or Notre Dame or, you know, very prestigious I mean, if you played football for Callaway High School, you were it. Yeah. And uh, so they made it to where I was ineligible to play, even though that was my district. And I didn't fight it. So I was ineligible my 10th grade year to play football. Uh, and then when I got there, I realized no 10th graders played at Callaway. So it, it all worked out. And I started at I, – I made the change from running back to wide receiver uh, my 11th grade year. At Callaway, I was a starter, um, and I started. I was a two-year starter, and ended up beca- becoming a you know, one of the top players in the city of Jackson, Mississippi, a top forty recruit at the time. And uh, I was fortunate to to meet Coach W. C. Gordon. I had plenty of offers, but t- Coach, the late co- Coach W. C. Gordon, recruited me at Jackson State, and uh, I became a Tiger mainly because I wanted to go and follow in my father's footsteps. Hmm. So um, that's awesome. Take me, take me back to your uh, recruiting process for Jackson State University, and uh, what other offers did you have other than Jackson State, and uh, what what made you choose Jackson State? Well, there were offers for from every school in the state of Mississippi that I can remember. I don't remember getting recruited from anywhere else outside the state. Obviously, I had Ole Miss, Mississippi State, uh, USM, University of Southern Mississippi. And then the HBCUs in the state, which is Mississippi Valley State, where Jerry Rice went to school, uh, oh. Alcorn State, where Steve McNair went to school. And uh, the recruiting process, well, it, it wasn't all that big because I had already made my decision where I was going to go anyway. Uh, Jackson State didn't need to put in much effort recruiting me because I was going to Jackson State regardless, uh, mainly because uh, my dad was playing there and Hall of Famer Lim Barney, uh, his son, uh, went there. Uh, Coach Robert Hughes, who also played in the pros, his son went there. So it was kind of like a second generational thing. And we all decided to go to Jackson State and become Tigers. That's amazing. You you pretty much just manifested everything that you wanted to do, you know? Yes, indeed. Now, I have a, I, I have a comment before my next question. So you mentioned kind of first being that kid who was on the sidelines waiting to get in. That was kind of my situation. Um, I just yeah. got to my ninth grade year, and I played quarterback. Um, I was about five six this year, and I had two guys who rode six foot one ahead of me, and I felt like I was just as good. I could make the same throws, I could mm-hmm. make the same decisions, if not better. Mm-hmm. But I didn't get that that opportunity. And when I did get my minutes, which was normally fourth quarter, two minutes left in the game, uh, uh-huh. and we're up like thirty forty. That's the only time I get in, and I made sure uh, I completed all my passes. I had two incompletions, no interceptions, but it's something that definitely fuels the fire that yes. next year when I go into it, um, you, you definitely want to be better. So, so my right. question is, how does Jimmy become Silk? You know, that, how do you, yeah. how do you uh, feed that? That was oh, my so, question. Oh. Yeah, uh, there was a reporter. I can't remember his name. I, I, I think he passed away, but he did all the Friday night games. He did all the Friday night, high school Friday night games. And uh, I remember playing a team, uh, Warren Central. It's out of Vicksburg, Mississippi. They were 
always good. And they had a guy named William Prince. Hmm. And William Prince was like the top dog in the state. Every school wanted William. Uh, he played running back. He played all the positions. And that particular night, uh, he was playing defensive back. And they had him lined up on me. And he covered me pretty much the whole game, the entire game, until the fourth quarter where I caught a uh, like a 14-yard post route on him for, for the winning touchdown. And uh, uh, after that touchdown, uh, that reporter, I cannot remember his name, but he called me Silky Smooth Jimmy Smith. Hmm. silk and that followed me well that was that was it uh as far as silk uh that was that senior high school year and then when I went to Jackson State they gave me a new name it was called Jughead I didn't like Jughead because it didn't fit. <laughs> I when like I, so. Obviously, I had a big head. My teammates, they started and they, they nicknamed me Jughead. All the guys on our team at Jackson State had some type of a nickname. If you had a, if you didn't have a nickname, then you, you're on the outside looking in. So I didn't yeah. like my nickname, Jughead, but I'm like, well, you know, at least my teammates like me. And they used to they used to brag on me all the time. Uh, I guess I got a big – I don't know. I didn't think I had a big head, but uh, – <laughs> Anyway, uh, so going back, you know, to the silk, uh, that's when I was I first I realized that, that you know the uh, the name silk. And when I got to the Dallas Cowboys when I was drafted, uh, that name showed it reared its face again. And uh, I believe Michael Irvin and Jerry Jones and, and several people around the organization with the Cowboys were referring to me as silk. <laughs> I love it. So yes. Speaking of the draft, uh, I want to talk to you about your draft experience. Obviously, you got drafted 1992, round two, pick 36 by the Dallas Cowboys, America's team. Uh, what was it like when you got the call from uh, Jerry Jones, Jimmy Johnson? And uh, this, this, explain the feeling once, when, with your, being with your family, too, and uh, once you get the name called. Yeah, I was, I was projected to go first round. I was a top receiver top senior receiver taken in that draft in 92 the uh, the two juniors that went ahead of me was Desmond Howard we all know Desmond he's uh, you know went to Michigan and Heisman Trophy winner my, my good friend Desmond and a guy named Carl Pickens out of Tennessee who ended up going to uh, first pick in the second round to uh, Cincinnati Bengals and uh, I was a part of the Herschel Walker trade when Jimmy Johnson made that trade in 1990-91 Okay. And, got, uh, and traded Herschel Walker to the Minnesota Vikings uh, in return for 30 picks over two years. Yeah. So the Cowboys were loaded as far as draft picks in 91 and 92. I think we had two first round, two picks per round for two years, 92, 91 and 92. And we were loaded with talent, so much talent that a lot of us couldn't get on the field. And I was one of the ones that couldn't get on the field because of so much talent. Mm -hmm. I remember talking to uh, one of the scouts. His name was Walt. Don't remember his last name, but he was a Dallas Cowboys scout that always that was always at our practices at Jackson State. Mm -hmm. and I walked up to him one day and created a conversation with him and asked him, I'm like, why, why are you here scouting and, and evaluating me when you guys have Michael Irvin and you just drafted first rounder Alvin Harper out of University of Tennessee? And his reply to me was, we're always looking to get better. And so I started to think to myself, you know what? Maybe I got a chance to be better than Michael Irvin. Mm -hmm. Well, when I got to the Cowboys, I saw how much Michael, how much work Michael Irvin put in. I'm right. just like, there's no way I'm going to hit the field. Hmm. I'm going to be riding the bench for the rest of my career. I'm <laughs> playing behind Michael Irvin. I have to get into a situation to where I'm not playing behind Michael Irvin. How can that happen? Well, my wishes came true, but. It didn't, you know, it benefited me, but at the time I struggled. I ended up getting released by the Cowboys, mm -hmm. picked up by the Philadelphia Eagles, where I just did not like the, the situation of the uh, Philadelphia Eagles with Rich Coltite being the head coach. He mm -hmm. didn't like me coming in as a Dallas Cowboy. Uh, Wooten, John Wooten was the uh, GM at the time, and yeah. he was a great talent evaluator. And mm -hmm. John Wooten actually brought me in. Uh, but Rich Cotite, I was not one of his guys, and I didn't have a fair shot of making the team in Philadelphia. 
So I set out all of 94 until the Jacksonville Jaguars came on board. Hmm. And then there you, ha- you had a beautiful uh, experience. Well, tell me, but going yes. back, you know, going back to the, the experience or, you know, without naming names, if you, if you didn't want to, but tell us about an experience within an organization where you felt like you had to rise above the challenge, something that you might, uh, might be a story that you could share with the upcoming players. Well, uh, I would take it back to both the Philadelphia Eagles, that situation when I came in uh, to camp as the 14th receiver on the roster. Mm -hmm. And by cutting time, by cutting time, I was number four. Keeping in mind, usually teams keep about five receivers. So kind of felt like I was in the door and made the team, but here comes Rich Kotite and he decides to cut me. Uh, That situation right there coming in as number 14 and by cutting time, you know, a month later, you number four is an incredible accomplishment, I thought. Yeah. But it just wasn't with the right team. And um, had a great preseason. Uh, uh, Coach Larry Pasquale, I played on all special teams in Philly. Fortunately, Larry Pasquale was a coach in Jacksonville that mm-hmm. first year. And he knew me. Uh, There was another guy, Ron Hill, who was a scout for the Denver Broncos, who was also scouting me at Jackson State. He just luckily happened to end up in Jacksonville. So I had two guys to go to bat for me when I was when I got to Jacksonville for that for that camp, for that tryout. Um, And I had a decent workout. I ran good times. uh, And that still wasn't enough from what I hear happened behind closed doors. Larry Pasquale told me some years later that they had really uh, graded me out as Fs all across the board. Right. I'm talking about I read a 4-4, caught all the balls, everything. I still wasn't their guy. Wow. So now, it sounds like you were answer- being redirected, and you also have that great mentality to stay open, to go with the flow of, like, where you're supposed to be. It, yes, right, right. Because I've been through it before with Philly, and I, I couldn't believe that it was happening again in yeah. Jacksonville. And – I realized, man, this happens so often and it's so common how there are so many guys, and I say this all the time, there are so many guys that are sitting at home. There are guys who I played with in high school. There are guys who I played with at Jackson State that were head and shoulders better than some of the guys I played with in the pros. Really? And it just goes to show you, yes, it just goes yeah. to show you how guys fall through the cracks. And if a team doesn't like you, no matter what your workout is, if they don't like you as a person, you can forget about it. And so, um, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. find out where you need to be and, and, and go with the flow and keep going. Yeah. Yes. Because you you really, you know, you ended up a great success. So. Well, I mean, it's a lot of hard work. Yeah. Extremely hard work. When I got to Jacksonville and uh, that training camp was the toughest training camp I've ever been through in my life in 95 with the Jacksonville Jaguars up at uh, – Stevens Point, Wisconsin. Now, you wouldn't think Stevens Point, Wisconsin is a hot area. You know, it was a country. It was nothing to do there. But just so happened, during those six weeks we were in training camp, I mean, it was pushing 100 degrees every day. Hmm. Oh, my gosh. And uh, I was not ready for that. And uh, you know, not mature enough as far as taking care of my body, doing the right stretching, putting the right foods. Well, we had a training table, but I still – wasn't, uh, I guess, educated enough to know that I needed to hydrate more, that I needed extra vitamin supplements to be able to go out to recover and go out the next day and perform at the, at the same intensity. So that's something that a young guy should take heed to is taking care of your body to give your body a chance to compete with the other guys that are out there. If you are, are not eating correctly and if you're not stretching correctly, if you're not hydrating enough, then you're fighting a losing battle against yourself rather than the guys that you're competing with to make the team. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, 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 so let me ask you this. Um, Tim Tebow comes in in Jacksonville. First of all, we all know it's NFL since we're not for long. Uh, there, there's 
a lot of business stuff that goes behind the scenes. But Tim Tebow comes in with with your former team, the Jacksonville Jaguars. And there's a lot of questioning that how does he get that spot after not being in the NFL for a while? People saying you should have made that position change and kind of just comes back and is automatically on that roster. What are your thoughts there? Um, he, I guess that he passed the eye test, but what are your thoughts on, on that move by Jackson? Well, well, a month ago, I, you know, they were talking about Tim Tebow being signed and the national media went crazy. And I watched Shannon Sharp and Undisputed a lot. Mm-hmm. I love that show. And yeah. Shannon mentioned to the fact that, well, they should have signed Colin Kaepernick. I'm like, what? <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> well, I mean, that's his job to stir stuff up. But yeah. I took the bait. I took the bait. And I, I went after Shannon Sharp. I went mm. after Dez Bryant. And I went after wow. Colin Kerhan. Only because this is it's my team. Yeah, The Jacksonville Jaguars, my name is on that stadium. Yep. Yeah, and my thoughts were at the time. I'm like, why don't why don't Shannon call John Elway and get John Elway to sign Kaepernick if he if he loves Kaepernick so bad so much? Yeah, let's see how that yeah. let's see how that conversation goes. Yeah, you know, we, and I was like, we don't we don't need Kaepernick down there. The reason Tim Tebow is, has signed the contract with with Jacksonville is only because of the relationship he has with Urban Meyer, mm-hmm. and that's just it. You know, you can hate on it or whatever. Yeah. These people kill me. Oh, Tim Tebow. No, he has a relationship. Look, if I had a relationship with Urban Meyer where he said, hey, Jimmy, come on down here and whatever, do whatever, whatever capacity. Bam, I'm out the door and I'm gone. Regardless of what people say of my athletic ability or my knowledge of the game or what, I'm gone. I'm sure if anybody had that opportunity, bam, they're out the door and they're gone. Exactly. Yeah. That's just the way the world works uh, and, and it's not just football i'm sure it's in all walks of life and everything you know it, it's all about building relationships and tim tebow and urban meyer have a very close relationship father son uncle uh, uh, nephew whatever you want to call it they have yeah. a relationship that's very close and you can't argue with that yeah, yeah. those boys in jacksonville jimmy smith looks ready to play still he'll still he'll still drop a couple of touchdowns on you yeah, yeah i still i stay ready yeah, I stay ready. Exactly. I, I know. Stay I mean, ready and look, show up. Mentally, I'm ready, but I don't know. After I get out there and run and maybe get hit once, one or two times, I'll change my mind. But uh, huh. you know, I, I love I love the franchise. Uh, I was the face of the franchise at one point. We've gone through some tough times here lately since 2017. Uh, every everyone remembers the original squad when we started in 95 and 96 we went all the way to the AFC championship 97 98 and 99 to the AFC championship unfortunately we lost to Tennessee Titans which they had a number that year and we failed to get to the Super Bowl but everybody remembers you know those guys you know and how hard how hard we fought to win games back then um and and hopefully with with Tim Tebow being there Urban Meyer being there Trevor Lawrence mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, you fair. can't help but to have, I mean, the national media is going to be all, that's why I'm doing this podcast now. Mm-hmm. You know, the way I see it is because of that TMZ interview that I did a month ago that went viral. Yeah. Me standing up for my team and standing up for Tim Tebow. I don't know Tim Tebow, right. but I know he's a good guy to have in the locker room. Mm-hmm. Even if he didn't, even if he didn't put on a shoulder, shoulder pads and helmets, he's still a good guy to have in the locker room. Mm-hmm. Yep. Rather than let's go ahead and put it out Kaepernick, which would divide a, a locker room and which, I mean, I got my, my ass torn, torn in two by saying anything about Kaepernick, but uh, it is what it is. It is what it is. I'm very happy that Tim Tebow is there. Uh, our young quarterback, as far as uh, Trevor Lawrence is going to need some type of veteran leadership because, you know, we our team on paper looks so so, but we're, chances are we're not going to win very many games this year. So someone needs to be there yeah. uh, for moral support, support for uh, emotional support for Trevor Lawrence because he's going to lose some ball games. This kid has never lost. What is he only lost four games in his entire career since he's been playing football? It's mm-hmm. incredible. So he's going to lose this year. So let's just kind of get that mindset ready. Now the following year is is when is is time to put up a shut up. But this year. 
he, he's going to lose some ball games until team finds the identity and, and starts to come together. And I think a great way of coming together is having a guy like Tim Tebow in that locker room who could bring the team together. He's a spirit builder, that's for sure. He's yeah. a spirit builder. And guys need that today. <laughs> I don't agree. care who you are. You need that in your locker room. We had it in our locker room. Mar Brunel was one of those guys. Tony Baselli was one of those guys. Hmm. We had Bible study in our in our locker room, which I thought thought was good. What's my wrong best with that? Friend, my best friend's father was the preacher for the Phillies, Eagles, Flyers, and Sixers, and and worked with special teams a lot, and and did this, um, you know, having the guys come together and and just connect, you know. So it takes yes. the connection outside, so that when you're on the field, in the intensity that you have that connection, you can make the ball connection. It's big. Like they say, a family that prays together stays together. Same way with the team. That locker room, guys, we're, we're family in that locker room. And there's nothing wrong with having a guy in there that's walking by faith and doing all the right things that he needs to do. So what if he's not a great tight end? We're not asking for him to go out and catch and become a Hall of Fame at tight end. We're not asking him to play quarterback again. It's just good to have a guy like that in the locker room. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to ask, about, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I want to ask you about the two Super Bowl runs, uh, obviously with the Cowboys, and you played back to back with the Bill, obviously with, against the Bills two times in a row. And what was that like experiencing uh, two Super Bowls playing against the same team and playing behind Michael Irvin? Mafia. Well, oh yeah, the, <laughs> well they weren't the mafia back then. Were they the mafia back then? No, but. No. From my eyes, from my standpoint, it was great to watch it from from the bench, from the sideline, because I wasn't getting on the field. But it was it was awesome to witness uh, how hard the guys worked. Uh, I was a part of that work, getting the guys ready, running routes in our defense, emulating Andre Reed or whoever the top receiver was, even though I didn't play. In the actual Super Bowl, I, I think that first game I may have gotten in for like three plays, but we were already blowing them out 50-something and whatever. Uh, but it was just great to be a part of it, regardless of the fact if I didn't play or not. It was a wonderful ride, and it was something that that I'm very grateful for to have two Super Bowl championships under my belt, even though I didn't play, but they're under my belt. That's amazing. Tell us about the um, the NFL Legends community. What's mm -hmm. that like? You're part of that, right? Yeah, I'm a part of it. And the NFL Legends community, um, they, they do a lot as far as trying to help retired guys that have struggles. We all have struggles making the transition. No matter how much money you made and, and you got left, you're going to have some struggles making that transition from an NFL player to a retired NFL player. You know, uh, when I retired, I fired everybody from my agent to the lady who came by my house to water the plants. I'm like, why do I need all these people? Mm -hmm. so I fired all, everybody. But in the midst of that, I fired some people that I really needed. You know, like I should have kept my agent uh, to keep, you know, appearances going and keep me active. But at that point in time during my career, I just wanted to get so far away from football because that's all I've done my entire life. So I want to get away from the locker room, the weights, I'm sure a lot of NFL guys feel the same way, but just keep in mind, you need to hold on to as much infrastructure as you can um, right. when you retire to help you make that, make that transition. Hmm. Yeah, I agree. Oh, you do you have a charger? Oh, great. One sec. Yeah. Okay. I wanted to ask you about uh, so, some of the obstacles that have come your way throughout football and afterwards. Um, and, and that you've overcome at every point. And I know you, you mentioned it, it's it's obvious that those are tough. It's obvious that those are stuff that a lot of people don't come mm -hmm. back from. Um, just your second Super Bowl win alone, I mean, being that sick and and still finding a way to get back and eventually, whether it was with the ja uh, with the Jaguars, um, come back and, and make an NFL return and still stand out. Or afterwards, you know, being through some hardships and starting a foundation to help other people in those shoes. How important is it to, because I talk about this a lot. I'm a kid and I want to inspire kids. And one of the ways to do that is to understand that failures happen and they're important. How important were those failures to your ongoing success? Well, just like Michael Jordan says, I failed 
more times than I have succeeded. And I'm grateful for those fail- failures because when I, my emergency, emergency appendectomy uh, that, that cost me a year of football in Dallas, I was thinking you were talking about my addiction that, that I had to deal with uh, throughout my entire career, you know? Uh, now people are getting more and more educated about the cannabis industry. Mm-hmm. Also, I had other issues with cocaine. Mm-hmm. Uh, being that dynamic, you get it's something you got. You got to have some kind of way to decompress, and that was my way of dealing with pain. That was my way mm-hmm. of dealing with anxiety, uh, uh, emotion, emotions, everything. Because when you turn on that film, you see the catching up. You go on YouTube and you. Google Jimmy Smith or put YouTube in Jimmy Smith and you see my highlights and you see those amazing catches. Well, how was he able to do that and, and come back from week to week to do it? And now that we're educated about cannabis, we realize that, you know, uh, that cannabis is the remedy for a lot of things. Hypertension, high blood pressure. There's a strand for that. There's a strand for pain. There's a, a lot of cancer patients are using cannabis for pain. You know, rather than DJ Chark for the Jacksonville Jaguars, their, their number one receiver, just had uh, an article maybe a couple of weeks ago of how he has to take this anxiety medicine. And it immediately took me back to Charles Haley uh, with the Dallas Cowboys. Mm-hmm. Charles Haley struggled big time, and they kept him loaded up with medicines. He was he, We used to joke sometimes because he, he was a captain locker room. I love Charles Haley, but a lot of people used to be scared of him. Well, we as rookies, me, myself, and I'm sure Dan Woodson won't mind me t- telling this story. <laughs> we were terrified of Ch- Charles Haley as rookies because we didn't know what he was going to do to us. But we, we were praying that he had taken his medications in the morning before he came to that locker room. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it comes to mind, what side effects is, ta- is, is, is Charles Haley dealing with today? Who knows? All right, now that goes back to the NFL legends community. What what are they? What are we doing, willing to help guys like that who's been prescribed these medicines like myself? Well, I had to take tortol shots before the game for pain. Hmm. Tortol shots. Well, after doing my research, there are over a hundred side effects that I'm gonna have to deal with from taking tortol shots. I'm glad I didn't take it very long, but. When I found out the side effects and the things that I could be dealing with, my post career is horrifying. So I know I said a lot and jumped around a lot, but that's the gist of it right there. That's why it's good to have the open conversations in the locker room so that you have coping, um, you know, great point. resources, and that and that that you can talk to people and, and compare notes and, and figure out how everybody uh, can keep up, but at the same time stay real and stay grounded and know, know what, well, uh, keep going. Uh, what that last part you just said, stay real and stay grounded is huge because that's what I live by. Uh, all of us have egos. We have to have a certain amount of ego to even compete out there on the NFL gridiron. But as long as you stay real, stay humble and stay grounded, you'll be just fine. And, uh, even with my addiction that I struggle with, especially right after uh, I retired, it was it was tough, scary. But uh, I did a lot of praying, a lot of rehabs. Mm-hmm. And it took some time in order for me to, you know, um, get my legs back under me. And I'm glad I'm able to sit here and do this interview with you today. Hmm. So um, looking back at your career, um, I have your numbers pulled up here over 800 receptions, over 800 receptions, over 12,000 12, receiving yards, over 60 touchdown uh, catches, and obviously two time Super Bowl, Super Bowl champ, five time Pro Bowl, uh, NFL receptions leader, uh, two time second, second team AP. Uh, how great are you to be in this position to be able to play the game you love, uh, follow your father's legacy, uh, to play at an HBCU school, Jackson State University, and, uh, and, and inspire a lot of people, and also. You, you were in the uh, Jaguars Hall of Fame, but do you, do you, in your opinion, do you believe that you, you, you deserve to be in the Hall of Fame, uh, the Pro Football Hall of Fame? Oh, of course I do. Yeah. I mean, a lot of us, you know, all of the guys, all of the receivers who are getting nominated today deserve to be in there. 
Why it's a bottleneck? Well, shoot, it needs you need it needs to be changed. It yeah. needs to be modified. Yep. The votes need to be not these sports writers who, if you're not their favorite player, you'll never get in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's all about, their, about that. Yeah, let's change the voting. Yeah. Let it be the people who matter and the people who know, like the coaches, the players, and the and the fans. Yeah, those right. three right there. The sports writers, and I know that I'm talking about the sport and I'll never get in because I'm not one of these sports writers' favorite player. But as long as I'm being nominated, that's good enough for me. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, I was I was just in Cleveland at the NFL draft. One of my favorite interviews was with Mr. David Baker, who is uh, the president and CEO of the Hall of Fame. So we might have some conversations. <laughs> well, look, well, well, you know, I've never had a chance to talk to David Baker, but I would love to. I would love to. I got you. All he got to do is look at the numbers and figure out why is it a bottleneck, you know? And like why? I said, I, I just I spoke with Chris Sanders. He was just saying that you're just such an incredible player yeah. to play against. There you go. There you go. Because he, he's seen it. He's witnessed it, you know? He's uh, He's been on, on, a, on a rival team, the Tennessee and Titans. And it's respect. That's, that's, it's respect for the commitment. It's for the, yeah, it's respect. Yes, yes, yes. So... You'll hear this from a lot of guys who are nominated for the Hall of Fame who are caught up in this bottleneck, like myself. A lot of people are saying it's because he played for Jacksonville. Yeah, I played for Jacksonville, but we still had to play Dallas, and we still had to play L.A. and New York. We still had to play the uh, the yeah. Patriots. We still had to play the Patriots. Yeah, <laughs> I still caught I still caught passes on Ty Law, who's one of the best in yep. the business, and he's in the Hall of Fame. I still had to catch passes on Anelius Williams, and he's the HBCU grad, and he's in the Hall of Fame. Uh, should I go on? I can keep going on and on and on. Go on, go on. Go on, go on. <laughs> keep going. No, I do that. Yeah, I'll name drop all day. <laughs> I, I, ask Pat Man Jones. Ask, ask Pat oh, Man Jones. Ask Samari Roll. Ask all of these defensive backs. They ask the receivers. Ask vote too. They should have teammates vote, too. Look, you know who had the heart, who had the commitment, who was there. Yeah, so uh, now we gotta yes. go, we gotta tell right. we gotta tell John Madden to uh, let's get our guy Jimmy Smith in the Hall of Fame, man. He deserves it. We gotta get Jimmy Smith in the Hall of Fame now. So yes, I, I would greatly appreciate it. But you know, it's uh, like I said before, what I'm most proud of is having my name stamped in the stadium. I'm down in Jacksonville, Florida. I'm most of that I'm That's all that matters right now. Now, uh, what happened? Oh, okay, never mind. Hopefully, hopefully, you know, they'll work it out. Sports Hall of Fame. Maybe they like it like that. Maybe they like having a bottleneck. Yeah. But it, it ain't, it's not good. It's, it's not good at all. You know, you take, for instance, my teammate, Tony Baselli. Well, I was talking to a guy down in Jacksonville, and he was like, well, after. This was Dan Edwards. He was like, after Tony Baselli gets in the Hall of Fame, then we'll start pushing you and Fred Taylor. Yes. Well, news bulletin. When did I have to compete with my own teammate to get to the Hall of Fame? When did I have to compete with a, a left tackle and a running back to get to the Hall of Fame? Right. Hello. I thought I was competing against other receivers mm -hmm. in the NFL. So that's the kind of stuff that, that I'm faced with, and it angers me. Because, uh, yeah, and I call their, their name out. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it doesn't make sense to compete with uh -oh. Yeah, it's cut out. Oh, yep. You're on mute. You're on uh, mute. mute uh, there we go. Okay, you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay, cool. I'm glad. I hope your editing skills is, is good. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so I want to ask you, um, so I, I heard something on the, uh, I, I heard something that you wanted to, once, once Deion Sanders got the job at Jackson State University, you, you reached out to him saying you want to be, you want to coach with him and, or you said something in the, inter during the interview, you said you want to coach with Deion Sanders and, uh, what, 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 what would that be like if he reached out to you to give you an opportunity to coach with him? Well, I was just saying that in excitement of Deion Sanders being there, you know, he doesn't have to hire me as a coach, but, you know, I'm always be there to 
help out the receivers or what have you, uh, you can give the next guy the opportunity. But if he comes calling, I'm not going to turn him down. I never do that, especially with my alma mater. Yeah, you know. So uh, I'm I'm fine. I'm fine with anything that Deion Sanders does because uh, of what he's doing right now. He's doing. He's making history, and he deserves the credit. Yeah, and he's doing some amazing things in HBCU. Let's let, let's just call it what it is. I mean, he's making people accountable in in HBCUs. Uh, uh, there, there's funding coming in there. You see what Pepsi just donated to the entire HBCU, mm-hmm. the entire SWAC? I mean, it's hundreds of millions of dollars. Nobody has ever done that in the HBCU. So hats off to Deion Sanders. His sons are there. His babies are there. And uh, he, he, he loves Jackson State. And I love Jackson State. And I love the fact that he's there. Absolutely. Um, you know, I got a chance to interview... One main reason because we're on – look, when's, when's the last time that Jackson State has been on ESPN 1 right. for consecutive weeks yeah. <laughs> in the spring on stage? I mean, come on now. You know what that does for recruiting? So Dude. watch out, SEC. Yeah, so I was thinking – We got a ways, but we're coming. I had the opportunity to talk to him a couple of years ago, and um, he's always been someone that, that's energetic, and you, and you can see that side of it. So it's great to see him there. Another person – um, at an HBCU right now as an assistant coach is Coach Hugh Jackson, who um, me and Nathan have had on the show and are a part of his foundation. Tennessee I'm, I'm State. Yep. Yeah, Tennessee State. That's so he's awesome. doing some big things there. That's a big shout out to him. That's huge. You're going to see guys from HBCUs get drafted again, like when I came out in 92. When I came out in 92, we had just as many guys get drafted going first, second, third round as all these other SEC schools. Look at our Hall of Famer list. Yeah. Just count our Hall of Famers and then match them up with any other Alabama. Well, maybe not Alabama. I don't know how many. Yeah. You can, you can, you can, we, we compete with Alabama, University of Florida, Mississippi State, anybody as far as how many Hall of Famers the Jackson State has put. In the Hall of Fame, or not Jackson State, but has and are currently now in the Hall of Famers. Robert Bernardi, and there's one more. Walter Payton, Jackie Slater, L.A. Rams, and hopefully I'll be number five. Hmm. Number five. five. So, so it looks like uh, it looks like you're busy. So a couple more things here and. Uh, so what advice would you give to these young athletes uh, that are trying to get to their goals? Oh, listen to this interview all, over and over again. That's my advice. What I think, you know, guys should do is, like I said earlier, is uh, go the extra yard in preparing yourself. Don't just rely on your God-given talent because there are a lot. You're not the only one with God-given talent. And there are a lot of guys with God-given talent. What are you going to do in excess of your God-given talent? You know, are you going to stretch? Are you going to eat right? Are you going to hydrate? You know, are you going to take the right supplements? What is it? Find it out. Uh, Is your home, uh, are you stable at home? That's one thing I had to find out also. You know, you have to have a stable home environment in order to go out there and perform at a high level on the gridiron. So make sure your home is stable. I learned that from Chris Carter. I'll give that one to Chris Carter. Hmm. Yeah, so the last... Oh, sorry. Just wanted to state this. It's been on my mind. Um, From Jackson, Mississippi to Jackson State to Jacksonville. Just wanted to say that. Oh, that is pretty cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I like that. I like that. Yeah, that could be on a T-shirt right there. Yeah. There you go. Hey, I'm I'm marking you right now. Call Under Armour. (laughs) Pick up the phones. We got you. <laughs> I feel you. So the last two things here, uh, before I let you go, like Vadon said, we're part of the Hugh Jackson Foundation, and we're trying to help him prevent human trafficking, make sure, making sure the community stays safe, the kids stay safe. So I'll send you the page. You can go check it out. Thank you very much. Yeah. And the last thing here, uh, would you like to say anything to all the nurses, doctors, and essential workers? Oh, keep up the good work. We need you. We all need you. You need yourselves because 
your job is very important, much more important than me going around and catching the football on Sundays. Your your job is life or death. So hats off. So uh, well said. There it is. That wraps up episode 818 uh, with two times wow. world champ. Yeah, former wide receiver from the Cowboys, Jaguars, Eagles. Uh, thank you again for coming on the show. It was truly an honor. And I'll be posting this on all social media formats. I'll send you everything. And um, keep up the great work with you and your family. Uh, you and your family stay safe. And we would like to have you back as a returning guest at some point so you can meet the full team. I would love it. Thanks for the opportunity. And thanks for having me on. No problem.